Aloha, I'm Rob Hack, and this is another episode of Exporting from Hawaii. Today I'm starting a new series uh, on specific topics about exporting, such as marketing, finance, logistics, trade shows, what have you. And today's episode will focus on marketing. In particular, we're going to focus on marketing in Japan. Most Hawaii companies are interested in Japan as their first export market. I don't always agree with that because I think Japan is a difficult market. There's others that are easier, such as Canada or Mexico with our free trade agreements there. But nonetheless, because of cultural similarities and um, lots of visitors from Japan to Hawaii every year, our companies focus on Japan. So that's what we'll do generally on this show uh, exporting from Hawaii. So when we're talking about exporting from Hawaii to Japan and marketing to Japan, I also want our companies here in Hawaii to focus on marketing to Japanese visitors. And we'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, next slide, please. Next. These are four areas of marketing activity that I'd like our companies to focus on. We market to our local Hawaii-based customers. We market to the mainland. And those are generally English-based marketing messaging, social media, websites, signage, what have you. But I would also like our companies to focus on marketing in the Japanese language. That's not always easy, but it's very doable. There's a lot of natural Japanese speakers here by which we can utilize them uh, for translation and what have you to get perfect uh, translations in Japanese. So I've created this model where we have local marketing, mainland marketing, then Hawaii-based Japanese marketing, and Japan-based Japanese marketing. And the modern marketing plan needs to be based on all four of these pillars. And I use this overlapping model of concentric circles here, where in the middle you could have very core messaging that's common to your products or services, but as you start to focus and target the segments of your local market, your mainland market, your Hawaii uh, Japanese visitor market, or your Japan domestic market, your messaging could alter somewhat from your core messaging in order to address that target market specifically. Next slide, please. Let's focus for a second on the Japanese customer. Japanese customers to a Hawaii company will be of two types, in my opinion. The point of sale is in Japan, where you are trying to get companies in or consumers or companies in Japan to uh, learn about your product, buy your product directly, uh, or perhaps they're planning for a trip to Hawaii and they're doing pre-trip research on what they'd like to do and what they'd like to buy. And so you're marketing to them in Japan in the Japanese language. If a customer in Japan buys from you via a, a local distributor in Japan or online sales, it's very likely to be a Japanese yen based transaction. The second type of customer that you'll have is where the point of sale is in Hawaii. More than likely, that's a US dollar transaction. Um, just because of our local prevalence of English, there's likely to be a mixed message uh, mixed language message to them in terms of Japanese and English, but we should try to have as much Japanese in the transaction as is possible. It's important to note that we have approximately 1.8 million Japanese visitors will come to Hawaii this year. Most of them come through Honolulu Airport, and the majority of them also come through uh, and do some tourism activity on Oahu. And hopefully more and more are going to neighbor island visits to the Big Island, Kauai, 
uh, Maui, Molokai, and beyond. But um, we know for sure that roughly 1.5 to 1.6 million of, of the 1.8 total are coming uh, through Oahu, coming through Honolulu, and even more specifically through Waikiki. So we must message to them correctly. Next, please. One of the things I'm continually surprised about when working with potential exporters and companies who want to export uh, to Japan or sell to Japanese visitors to the islands is that we are not marketing Hawaii and Aloha enough in our messaging. And we really need to play that up much more. The state of Hawaii, both in terms of dollars coming from DBET, but also just the general existence of Hawaii is doing 24-7 marketing for our customers here, our, our companies in Hawaii. And we have a tremendous word association value with the words Hawaii and Aloha, meaning customers in Japan or anywhere in the world, when they hear the word Hawaii and they hear the word Aloha, they get a wonderful feeling about that. It's much different than some other words that you can imagine when there's word association. So when customers in Japan hear the words Hawaii, hear the words Aloha, similar words like that in Hawaii, they automatically think of uh, blue sky, clean ocean, palm trees, sandy beaches, good temperature, those types of things. So there's a natural association for natural products, products that are clean, products that are fresh, made with fresh ingredients, organic. Uh, products like that have a natural follow-on to the words Hawaii and Aloha in terms of marketing wordage, verbiage, and usage. So our companies need to really focus on that and market that as much as possible in their products and just have it baked into their marketing plan. Next, please. Another common mistake that our companies here in Hawaii make is that we tend to believe that English is usable when dealing with Japanese, and it's not. It simply is not possible to have a good marketing strategy to the Japanese mainland or to Japanese visitors here based on English, either spoken or written English. And so we need to use proper Japanese in our verbiage on signage, on websites, in emails, and social media. And as I said earlier, it's not hard to do. There's uh, many, many locals uh, that are here in Hawaii that are visiting from Japan uh, that live here, have lived here a long time, or are going to school here, what have you. And it's very easy to get good, simple translations for marketing messages. Do not rely on Google Translate or similar services. And here I highlight a couple of places where you can get some simple words, um, but I certainly would not focus just on uh, Google Translate. And also we have to be sensitive of the fonts that we're using. As in English, you can imagine if you have a website or you have a pamphlet and you're using fonts such as New Times Roman versus Ariel versus Helvetica versus myriad, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of different fonts. Each one of those fonts has a slightly different message about your uh, product, your company, your company culture, the service that you provide. So we have to think about that uh, in Japanese as well, that there's many fonts. Thankfully, there's not as many as there are based in the English language, but there are several fonts that we have to look at. So depending on whether you're trying to convey that your company is a young, energetic, or you're sort of an older company that's very um, fixed and proud or what have you, 
it, the font can say a lot about that. So um, we have to be sensitive to that. So please look out for that. Next slide, please. A major concept for uh, marketing to Japanese and um, to Japanese visitors to Hawaii is the concept of omiyage. And I think most listeners of this show will be somewhat familiar with the term. But I think most people who try to translate it quickly into English will use the word souvenir. And that's not exactly a good translation. Omiyage is um, uh, much more complicated than just a souvenir. So omiyage would be, you're trying to, as a visitor to Japan, uh, to, as a visitor from Japan to Hawaii, you're trying to take back to Japan uh, a piece of your trip and share it with your family, your colleagues, your friends, uh, what have you. And there's cer certainly different levels of omiyage. So for if you're taking um, something back to your boss, it might be uh, different than say to your secretary or something to your, taking something to your mother-in-law would be more uh, complicated than say to um, your niece. Let's put it that way. So the average Japanese tourist spends a lot of time and energy and money working on calculating this omiyage and what they're taking back. And you'll often see them buy lots and lots of things. Of course, there's standard um, chocolate macadamia nuts and that sort of thing. But generally, I think the better omiyage practice is um, selling to the customer prepackaged omiyage that they can buy quite easily and that their decision process is relatively short and you can have different levels of uh, omiyage available. So uh, say, for example, a $100 package and a $50 package and a $10 package that would allow the customer to buy things very quickly um, and, and not have to decide very much. Can we go to the next slide, please? Because I think our companies here in Hawaii are not, generally speaking, doing a good enough job of packaging in that the package that a Japanese tourist is going to take back to Japan has to be packaged nicely so that they are able to give it to um, uh, their colleague or family member or friend directly. And usually that means wrapped and more often than not, that means um, in a bag, a, a, a small two-strap bag, uh, like this girl in the picture here has, that type of package she could hand to somebody directly. Um, in Japan, it's it's uh, sort of verboten to just hand somebody a gift that's not wrapped and not in a bag. So if you're, as a Hawaii company, able to provide that bag and a um, nice looking packaging, it makes it so much easier for your customers to buy from you uh, and take that back to Japan. The, the decision process for them to purchase is very, very simple and clean. I would also say that um, Japan uses a tremendous amount of packaging. The US in general uses more packaging materials than Japan does, but that's largely because it's a bigger country with more people. But on a per capita basis, Japan uses the most packaging materials by far of any other country in the world. So please keep that in mind. Next uh, slide, please. The other thing I am constantly telling our local companies is we have to segment the market and find out who really is your target market segment. As I said earlier, there's roughly 1.8 million Japanese tourists will visit Hawaii this year. Not all 1.8 million are likely candidates uh, to buy your product or service, but there is a certain segment of that 1.8 million who assuredly are your target market segment. And this is in segmentation is a key component of marketing. And this is where we're talking about trying to find hypothetically uh, your customer would be a female age 26 to 35 with an income of X uh, yen per 
month and an education of such and such and probably lives in a metropolitan area, what have you. Um, every product will have a different target market segment, but nonetheless, that's for you to try to figure out and you should be spending lots and lots of energy trying to figure out exactly who is your customer and then your messaging should sing to that target market segment. So if you are posting to social media, you're posting information to your website, you're writing pamphlets, you're putting signs out um, of your shop or your booth, that the messaging that you're putting there will seem very important to that target market segment. And it's particularly critical if you start sending email newsletters because um, if you're sending email newsletters to a target market segment and your verbiage is correct, that target market segment will be very likely to open that email, at least glance at it. Whereas if you're sending messages to just everybody, you're going to get a lot of spam complaints and what have you because you're sending messages and targeting people who simply are not interested in your product and never will be. So we don't want to waste time, energy, and precious money uh, going after those types of customers. Next slide, please. I talk about Japan as a very interesting demographic in that roughly now there's 126 million people in Japan. So it's obviously a much larger uh, market than just selling in Hawaii. Um, Japan uh, is getting older the population is actually shrinking, but I think um, this older population that's focused on healthy, natural products is a great opportunity for our Hawaii customers. In Japan, they call it QOL. They actually use that English acronym for quality of life, and that's for the elderly geriatric population uh, and developing technologies and products and transportation services and a whole myriad of societal issues that are based upon this aging population. So just some simple data here is 30% are over 65. Um, that's actually rather incredible. And uh, more than 100,000 people are 100 years old or more, which is also quite incredible. So it's a fantastic opportunity for our companies to focus in on that target market segment. And many of these elderly uh, customers are visiting Japan also, I'm uh, sorry, visiting Hawaii also. So it's important to think about if that is a target market segment for you, then we want to develop some messaging for that particular target market segment. Next, please. Pricing. If you're pricing product uh, for the Japanese market or for Japanese tourists that are visiting Hawaii, there's a few more issues you have to look at when you're trying to determine what is your uh, street price for your products and services. Particularly in Japan, uh, you have to look at Japanese uh, packaging, Japanese language on the packaging and labeling. Um, if you're shipping product to Japan, which is a very big issue that we'll talk about it soon, um, shipping is quite expensive from Hawaii to anywhere, uh, the mainland included. But shipping to Japan, you may have uh, some tariffs depending on what your product is, uh, inbound taxes, um, then you certainly might have domestic shipping. So if you're shipping by air, by ocean, they'll land at an airport or uh, at a port, say Yokosuka, for example, by ship. And then from, from that port, the product has to be transported somewhere else in Japan. And the Japanese domestic transportation system is quite efficient and cost effective, but nonetheless, you have to understand that uh, price very clearly when you're setting your, your complete price for the product. Um, don't forget about commissions for agents uh, or distributors or 
what type of system you're using uh, to actually get the, the products to your end users. Another topic that could be um, complicated depending upon what types of products you're selling is, are there warranty claims uh, after the fact? So for example, if you sell something to Japan and it turns out to be um, a mislabeled or the wrong product or what have you, and the customer has to ship it back to Hawaii, uh, who pays for that shipping? And then you're going to you have to turn around and send them a new product. So there's another amount of shipping there. So all of that has to be amortized over time and built into your pricing, uh, similarly for spare parts. There's some products that we're making in Hawaii that are excellent, excellent products and are um, coveted by Japanese consumers. However, those products need to be tested by the Japanese authorities, let's say, for analogous to the FDA in the US. And um, the process for getting those products tested is um, not arduous and not extremely expensive, but nonetheless, it needs to be done. And um, that entire process is in Japanese. There's, there's almost no English involved. So you really need somebody on your side to help you uh, get those products tested in Japan. And eventually you have to build in the price of that testing back into you and, and, and uh, labeling back into the price of the product. Generally speaking, over time, selling in Japan shouldn't be more expensive than selling here locally in Hawaii. At first, it may seem that way because of shipping and what have you, but as your volumes go up, your price per unit in Japan, the street price in Tokyo shouldn't be different than the street price here in Honolulu or on Maui or wherever you are in Hawaii. Another similar issue that uh, you have to follow closely are the foreign exchange rates. Uh, between the Japanese yen and the U.S. dollar. Right now, in terms of historical levels, uh, history being, let's say, the past 25 or 30 years, the Japanese yen is rather weak against the U.S. dollar. I'd suggest today it's around 114 yen per dollar. What that means is that for Japanese customers who are buying your product in Japan, or Japanese visitors to Hawaii who are buying your product at street price in Honolulu, the products seem rather expensive to them compared to the past uh, 25-ish years where the dollar was weaker against the yen so that when tourists would come here, they would think that the products were quite cheap. Hotel rooms were rather inexpensive. Uh, flights were felt more inexpensive. However, now, uh, because of the weak yen, the customer that's coming to Hawaii feels like things are expensive. And so we need to understand that and we need to follow the foreign exchange trends to, to fully appreciate what our customers think the product uh, pricing feels like to them in Japanese yen. So it can go up and it can go down uh, there can be um, long-term trends, of course, but there can be short-term trends for whatever reason could be caused by weather and earthquakes or other acts of God, but also political reasons and what have you. And if for some reason it felt extremely expensive, if the yen weakened tremendously very quickly, it might be a good opportunity to lower your price in Hawaii so that um, customers are not um, put off by the um, short-term high price that they feel the product is at. Next, please. This is just a quick trending graph of what um, the yen has looked like since uh, roughly 1970. Um, there was a time in the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, when you can see, I think even in 90, 1994, the yen got down into the 70s, around 78 yen per dollar. And what that meant was that 
it felt incredibly cheap for Japanese to visit the U.S. and, and vice versa. It felt that incredibly cheap U.S. products in the Japan domestic market. But now things have um, appreciated more in terms of U.S. dollar side and the, the products generally from the U.S. now feel somewhat expensive to them. Next, please. A critical part of marketing in Japan is building into the marketing plan what we'll call after-sales service. Of course, not many of our companies in Hawaii are building machinery or that type of product where we have to have on-site um, wrenchers uh, doing preventive maintenance and changing parts and, and doing these types of things. But nonetheless, we need to be able to uh, contact our customers after the sale, follow up with them. How is everything? How's, how is the product quality? Would you recommend it to other, uh, your friends and colleagues? We have to do a much better job of that rather than just making a sale and moving on. Some of this is a language barrier, but it doesn't need to be. As I said earlier, if you if we're going to do business with Japanese, we must get accommodated to doing that in the Japanese language as much as is possible. And we really don't have any good reason to back away from that in Hawaii. There's plenty of opportunity to find uh, qualified Japanese speakers, readers, and writers who can help um, with follow-up messaging after the sale um, be it by email or social media or text message or uh, written notes, handwritten notes that you mail to customers. I think that that's extremely important in the Japanese market and we just simply don't do enough of that here in Hawaii. Next, please. Shipping from Hawaii to Japan. This is a extremely, can be an extremely complicated topic by which we could have an entire episode of the show exporting from Hawaii just focused on shipping. Nonetheless, uh, it's an important topic. I think what we should do is bring this up after the break. Uh, so right now, let's take a quick break from exporting from Hawaii. When we return, we'll pick up with shipping from Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show and is streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome back to Exporting from Hawaii. I'm Rob Hack from Insight Inter Asia. Where we left off, we were talking about shipping from Hawaii to Japan. And this is an extremely critical topic when trying to calculate pricing for your products. Um, shipping, as we all know, from some small islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to either the mainland or to Japan is expensive, especially by air. And we are trying very aggressively to get our companies here to get volumes up to the point where they can ship by ocean. Now, fortunately, you can ship by ocean directly to Japan, uh, generally to Yokosuka, but there are other ports. And it makes things much more cost effective. Uh, next slide, please. I do a very brief uh, overview that I've taken from a client. Uh, these are actual numbers where if you're shipping one $25 widget 
uh, from Honolulu to Tokyo. It costs $25 street price here, but to get it to Japan very quickly by priority mail, eventually the shipping price will wind up to be $31 per that one unit. So the shipping price is actually more than the value of the product itself. Then on the next slide, I, or the next line, I talk about getting the shipping price down to $3.58 per unit if you can pack up to 24 items, widgets, in one larger priority mailbox. And 24 is a limit by which you are allowed to uh, import something into Japan at one time uh, and not necessarily pay a, a tariff. It would be for personal use of that 24. So if you were sending 24 items to one individual customer in Japan, this is uh, one possible way to do it. Again, a $25 product adding approximately $4 uh, per unit on shipping is not terrible but nonetheless um, it's still relatively expensive but if you look at sending 2,500 units on a pallet uh, uh, and that whole pallet costs roughly $500 to ship to Japan um, you're getting it down to 20 cents or, or thereabouts per unit shipping and that's where we need our companies to get to. So again, shipping is an extremely complicated topic. Um, it's expensive, we know that, we, uh, people fully understand that here, but it's something that is surmountable. And I will have further episodes on exporting from Hawaii just talking about uh, and addressing the shipping issue. So with that, I'll uh, sign off today. We'll be back with more episodes of this and even talking about marketing more in the future. There's a lot to say about social media in Japanese and what have you. Again, I'm Rob Hack. Thank you for watching Exporting from Hawaii.